Okay, we'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, six thirty-three. Um, next we need to uh, have an approval on the agenda. Okay, we'd like to call the meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. Okay, the motion is seconded and approved. Um, next we'll go to strategic planning. We got to have a roll call vote. Oh. All right. Straighten me up there, Julie. All right. <laughs> Schmidt. Yes. Haas. Yes. Merkel. Yes. Lee. Yes. Procknet. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So that is passed. Um, next, we'll go to strategic planning. Um, that's where you want to take over, Jeff? Or? Sure, I can I can take it from there. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight's meeting is going to be largely geared around our strategic plan and the work that has been done. Uh, we have conducted um, a set of surveys that went out to staff, parents, and community, uh, as well as students. Uh, we've conducted an equity survey that went out to staff, uh, students, and parents. And then we have also done uh, at least nine listening sessions and collected lots of different data. We've gone through a comprehensive needs assessment at each site uh, and brought all that information together. We've had a strategic planning committee that's met three times over the last month. And that team consisted of just under 50 people, which includes students, staff, uh, parents, community members, city leaders, and um, as well as uh, building administration. And today we're going to look at where that has all taken us and how those ideas have come together into what Ms. Gilman calls a plan on a page. Um, we've taken all that information and boiled it down to some uh, a mission, a belief statements, mission statement, vision statement, and then some goal areas um, uh, for us to consider. And with us tonight too is also the writing team who has done an amazing job of taking all those different ideas and trying to get people's voice into those ideas. So when they look at that plan, it says, wow, that I was a part of that process and the community can really see that. So they are here tonight to help talk about it. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Ms. Gilman from the Minnesota School Boards Association, who is going to be leading us through this evening. Hey, thank you, Superintendent. Ben Thornton, and you did a nice job of framing the work that we have been doing over the last few months. I looked back at my notes today, and I think it was January 11th when I met with the board and did a presentation on what we would be doing in the next few months. And lo and behold, we have accomplished, I think, everything. And now you are ready with your new strategic plan on a page. Um, Superintendent Horton, I think I am going to do a share screen, make sure you should have all received this ahead of time, but this is the culmination of all the work from you and all your stakeholders in the past few months. And your stakeholders included representatives of student body, staff, both licensed and non-licensed, your administrative team, you as a board, and also community members. And to uh, do a recap of some of the things that we did, we started by looking at belief statements. And the belief statements were basically your values. We did this as a team and came up with the five that are listed here. Then we spent some time talking about the mission statement. We reviewed your former mission statement and talked about rewriting. And this is the, the new mission statement. Uh, provide an equitable and quality education that meets the need, uh, individual needs of our students to thrive in the 21st century. And then we talked about a vision statement and uh, ended up, remember vision statement is something you're going to put on that billboard on the highway. So it's going to grab people and say, why this school? Why do I want to enroll my, my child into this school district? And so the vision statement uh, GFW, Growing Future World-Class Leaders. And so these are the items that 
we consider the foundational items of your strategic plan. Now, one thing that I should mention is since our third strategic planning committee meeting, we worked on each of these foundational items and then we turned it over to a writing team who did some final crafting, a uh, little bit of, of maybe uh, tweaked a few words and things like that. Um, so basically kind of did a cleanup for it, but we still maintained the integrity and the messaging that the strategic planning committee identified. And then we looked at focus areas and how we identified the focus areas were the themes that came through with the listening sessions, with the evaluations, the surveys that we uh, sent out to the community and also internally. And then the feedback that we got from strategic planning committee members. So we landed with a focus area and you can see, oops, on the left-hand side here of student achievement, finance, diversity, equity, and inclusion, community and family engagement. And the last one is positive school climate. Each of the focus areas has a goal and the goals were the overall direction, what we will or you will or what GFW will accomplish, keeping in mind that your strategic plan is for the next three to five years. For each of the goals, there are objectives that put a little bit more meat into exactly how you're going to accomplish each of those goals. Now with the goals and the objectives, the writing team, and you're gonna hear from them in just a second, but your superintendent and the writing team then took your feedback from their draft goals from the last meeting, the last committee meeting, added in a few more items because you all had a chance to provide input on what might've been missing or what might've needed to be tweaked, things that we didn't want to forget about. And so what you see here is the almost final version of your strategic plan on a page. What we would like to do this evening is uh, review the goals and objectives. And then as board members, if there is anything that you see here that you still have concerns about, things that should be uh, identified in a different way, we do want to hear from you. So this evening, we won't be adopting the strategic plan. That's something that you'll likely do at a, an upcoming meeting, but this will be your, your glance at it, and then you'll have a chance to look at a final version. So with that, uh, Mr. Horton, I think I'm gonna turn it back to you and your writing team if you'd like to walk through the goals and objectives. Uh, absolutely, we can do that. And I invite the, um, the writing team to share their different thoughts on it. So I'm gonna just kind of introduce it and. Um, writing team members, please jump in and share your different thoughts. And we'll kind of just go kind of focus area by focus area. Uh, the first one being student achievement. Um, and there's two areas in this that are being focused on. The first one is really aligning to the Every Student Succeeds Act and World's Best Workforce. This is the federal and state legislation pieces that says these are the things that the state and the federal government is saying we need to do. Um, and so that includes 90% um, of all students uh, graduating from high school, for example, that's under ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And uh, with no demographic group, meaning um, any students in special education, who are receiving special education services, uh, um, students of color, uh, any group has to, cannot be below 85%. Those are things that we're required to be working on. Um, it also includes things like career and college readiness and consistent attendance. And so that's what you see there in the first goal area. The second one is how do you work on that? And this is where the um, continuous improvement framework comes in. And how do you continue to work? On, how do you research evidence-based practices? And how are you going to go about implementing those and making sure you're doing what you say you're going to do? Um, so that is the framework in which you can do the work to, for, to improve student achievement. Um, and we have with us tonight uh, um, our people, we have staff that are on the continuous improvement teams, including um, Mr. Langemo 
and Ms. Blumhofer, who are on the continuous improvement teams at each of their sites, along with their building uh, principals and other teachers. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about that because they really are on the ground with that continuous improvement team doing that ground level, that ground level work with some of this. So uh, team, what are your, some of your thoughts that you'd like to share around student achievement and why you felt that these were good goals? Um, I guess getting into, into the, the second one a little bit, uh, you might notice as we go further into this that some of the different areas have dates that kind of set benchmarks as far as when we'll get to this stuff. But I, I think in the second one, it, it'll be nice to have the conversations at the building level kind of around this framework as to what specific steps that we need to do to kind of build those college readiness pieces and, and just kind of see how big the task at hand is and get you know, feedback at the building level and, and get going from there. So I guess that covers my thoughts on the second one. <laughs> um, I'll jump in here a little bit. We also had a, a bit of a conversation in terms of um, when we look at the first one with the English language proficiency and the MCA growth and just how important it is for us to um, make sure that our English, English language learners are getting all they need to be successful. Um, we understand that, that we have had some work to do in that area and we still have work to do in that area. And we just wanna make sure that we're connecting those two items so that we can reach all of our learners. Any other thoughts on uh, the student achievement area that people would like to share? I would just share that the these goals are pretty broad and you know from more of like the MDE level because then in our buildings we can work specifically with our different teams, our MTSS teams, our CIT teams, um, our child study teams or student study teams to help support our students at this level. So. Um, this kind of just sets us up for um, what our goals would be at different committee levels, too. A, a piece I can share with that is that each building will be working on developing a school improvement plan. So upon adoption of a strategic plan, um, they will be setting out with their continuous improvement teams to set smaller level goals. These are broad because they're at the district level. And then MD is even broader at their level. So they'll get down really kind of into the, bring it down more to the, the classroom level, the student level um, to really be making a difference in that. So, um, so that's, the, that's some of the work that'll happen post this. And those are things we can come back to the board and show to say, hey, you know what, here's our school improvement plan. And here's, here's how we're working towards these goals at this site. Uh, do board members have any questions around the area of student achievement for the writing team? The, the only question I have is I see the career and college readiness plan by eighth grade and um, Principal Galeka stated, you know, that they can do stuff after the fact, but like, you know, as students progress and they're you know, following up and making sure they stay on their plan so they get to the graduation rate. Um, I'm not sure if anything else is needed more or if that's gonna be monitored, you know, like these are the broad goals and there's better goals in the back, I don't know. So that's, that's just my question. Yeah, I can address that. Um, so the career and college readiness plan um, or goal helps with the student's individual plans. So in eighth grade by ninth grade, they have, they're beginning those processes, they're taking the aptitude tests, they're making a plan on where they want to go so that during their high school careers, they can be taking classes that are aligned to it. They can have those conversations with their homeroom teachers or with our guidance counselor or myself, um, with all the people that are going to support them in um, what that 
post high school career or college experience is going to be for them. So just having that process start early um, so that we can support them throughout high school is the goal. And yes, they will be checked in on and followed up with yearly and more hopefully daily almost um, with what their vision, what their plan is for their post, um, their post high school careers. Hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions in the area of student achievement or should we move to the next focus area? And we can always go back to if you get a thought later on, so it doesn't have to be so linear. <laughs> Okay, finance. Um, in the area of finance, this is uh, this is one that we felt was really important to be in there, um, given our current situation. So, a GFW will develop and maintain a fiscally sustainable budget. Um, we've been deficit spending for um, close to a decade, and so this is going to be uh, our goal is to not do that. Um, and so, the first step of that is getting out of the statutory operating debt. And uh, to Mr. Langemo's point about the dates, this one we did feel needed dates because we needed to make we needed to make progress and had to have those accountability marks in there. With the uh, student achievement piece, there's different aspects and different timings of things that at the building level that maybe they can be setting timelines for. Uh, but at this level, uh, we really felt that you know we have some goals that we need to set and we need to hold ourselves accountable to that. So the first one would be to get out of statutory operating debt by fiscal year 2022. Um, and then to upgrade, update our fund balance policy. Uh, we currently have a fund balance policy, but to review that and put that in alignment with the Minnesota Department of Education and the auditors. Um, the next step from that would be to um, maintain a fund balance in alignment with that policy to make sure that we are in a good place. Mm -hmm. um, our auditors had mentioned, exam for example, we need to be at between 8 and 12 percent. And in order to not have to borrow money, that's kind of where we need to be. Um, and then uh, creating a sustainable replacement schedule. Our teachers would love the idea of having curriculum, <laughs> new curriculum, and to replace that on a regular basis. Um, our transportation department would love to know that they can afford to get new vehicles when they need to get new vehicles. Our students and staff would love to know that as technology uh, fades and becomes outdated, that we have um, a plan to replace that so they can do the great things that they want to do. So um, after we get uh, our fund balance in order and we then can then dedicate some funding for that replacement schedule in each of the departments, um, and then we also put in the facility plan that um, whether that be uh, maintaining what we have and staying where we are, or that means exploration of other options, that is a goal by 2025. Uh, questions, comments about that team, anything that you wanna share about that piece? If there's no questions, we can go on to finance. And if people have questions, we can definitely circle back or we can just go, go to the next one, excuse me, but uh, we can go back to finance. Uh, diversity, equity, um, and inclusion. Um, so this one uh, is that we will develop and implement an equity framework. So this is a very broad goal. But again, on this one, uh, we did feel like, feel like we needed to put some dates on this one to hold ourselves accountable to those dates. And so the first step with this one would really to be go and do some research. There are other school districts that have adopted um, equity policies and have been doing this work. Uh, the 24 districts around the country that we've been meeting with around equity, some districts have these, some districts don't. And so the team felt that based on the equity diagnostic we did, based on um, 
the direction that the Department of Education is, is saying we should go based on best practices that we should really be looking at an equity policy. Um, from there, um, we create the framework and then we implement it. Now, what that looks like, we don't have an answer for yet. Uh, we need to do some research. We need to do some training and, uh, and then come up with some ideas. So our goal would be over the course of the next year to develop a policy. And then from there, create a framework and then start an implementation plan for that framework. And that ties back to our other goals about um, continuous improvement and in terms of uh, every student succeeds acts and world's best workforce where we are asked to make decisions um, that are equitable to um, fund the programs. And I think uh, English language proficiency was one of the areas mentioned earlier by Ms. Blumhofer about going back to how are we ensuring that those learners have what they need to be successful? Because we are required to have 90% of students graduating, 90% of students passing the reading, 90% of students um, passing the math with, uh, with no subgroup below 85%. So and that, that's, that, that takes work, that, there, that's good work to be doing, but this policy would help us move in that direction. So that's, that's why this is there. And, that was part of the timeline that we had for our, our work. Uh, team, what thoughts do you have about the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion goal and objectives that you'd like to share? I would just like to say that, um, you know, all three of these say develop, create, or create. And that just shows that we're in the beginning parts of this goal, which is great. But um, as a district, it's a focus. And we want to make sure that in our strategic plan, um, people can see that we're working towards that and that it is a focus. And it's something that we do take very important. Um, and we want to do it right, too. So. We had a really good conversation over it. I, I kind of like that there's there's just three points in there. It has the dates, it keeps us moving, but it gives us a lot of flexibility to use that diagnostic tool and figure out what we're doing well, what should be a high priority, what, what do we need to emphasize, um, what should we focus on improving first. So I, I like that. Again, like, like they were saying, it has the benchmarks to keep things moving, but it also has some ambiguity in it in that way too. One thing Principal Glecka referenced was uh, uh, some information from NERN, the National Implementation Research Network, NIRN. And what she was referring to was the different stages of um, implementation science. And so the first stage is um, exploration. And that's where we are in some of our areas. These are new things and we, we have to spend time in there. And that's, and that's the first step. Once you go there, you get to uh, installation. And in the installation phase, you're working towards sustainability. And then you get to your initial implementation phase. That's the third phase. And then you get to full uh, implementation, which is usually around 80% or so of um, based on different measures. And that's a two to four year process to go through all that and to really do it well. Um, and that's coming out of, again, uh, NERN, the National Implementation Research Network. So she had made some reference to that. And so these are areas that we're gonna be um, working on. And that's just where we are today. Um, when we come back um, and update our strategic plan in three to five years, we'll be at a different place with that. And I guess I would just add that, um, you know, even though we are in this beginning stages, um, the Department of Education has their Minnesota equity commitments. And we certainly are um, looking at those and reminding ourselves of those as we meet and as we make decisions, even at this time. Uh, members of the board, do you have questions around diversity, equity, inclusion, or did this create any new questions going back to the other two focus areas? Um, I guess my question here, it says by 2022, does that mean 
by the start of the 2022 school season, which would be June, correct? Or First, the first one says by 2022, GFW would develop an equity policy. Um, so we can interpret. We can interpret how you feel that that goal should be. I, I looked at that team jump in. I kind of was thinking the 2022 school year, so we would take the next school year to develop that. But perhaps we weren't clear enough in in stating that. Yeah. That's that's. I mean, that's fine. That's pretty. I think it's going to take some time. I think we want to do it right. Um, so I don't know. But some people might take my ideas differently, but I mean, I'm okay with that. But, but I would prefer it to be in 2022 that you just cool your, but I don't know. That's, uh, you know, as Ms. Gilman talked about, this is a good chance for us to make some mm -hmm. adjustments. And so that could be some clarifying language we add. We could say by the 2022, by the 22, 23 school year, the start of the 22 23 school year, we could we could rephrase that a little bit other questions or thoughts that folks would like to share on the diversity, equity, inclusion focus area or any of the others? Okay, the next area. Thank you. Oh, sorry. No, I just, I just said I'm good, thank you. Okay. Uh, in the area of community and family engagement, GFW will empower families to foster partnerships to support students of birth to 21 within and outside of our schools. The language of birth to 21 really starts, um, that's where we start. And Ms. Shiro here is here and she works with our early childhood programming and we start supporting students right away. Um, she is contacting families very shortly after uh, the birth of a child to get them information on how they can be supported. And we service students all the way up to 21. Uh, folks may not realize that, but um, we don't stop at 18, we go through age 21. So that's why we included the birth 21. Um, and in this area, we'll be ensuring equitable access to programs and initiatives. So part of that is in the equity piece is about um, making sure people have access. Um, strengthening and expanding family engagement partnerships, uh, creating communication plans. We heard that people, um, have seen some improvements in communication, but still would like to see more communication. And so what is our plan? What, what communication plans are we creating around the different things we're doing? Um, and then also working with our community with career and college readiness opportunities. We've had some folks that have talked about doing um, different internships. And there was even recently a, a student that I'm aware of that was interested in becoming a superintendent and uh, what that was entails. So how are we how are we creating those opportunities to uh, support our students in career and college readiness? And this could be work experience. Uh, this could be regional partnerships. There's a lot of different areas you could go with this. So um, there's work to be done there. And I think we've had some of that in the past and uh, that's something that we can, we can do some work on. So that was the community engagement, community and family engagement section. So questions and thoughts around that area. And writing team, please feel free to add some. I know we spent a lot of time in these last couple areas trying to get the language right. We had a lot of conversation about how we can do a better job of making sure that we are getting families involved in our school and, and making sure that that involvement continues throughout the kids' um, experience while they're at GFW. Um, it seems as though we, we get lots of involvement when kids are in preschool, they're in elementary school. It's, it's really easy to get parents involved and, and reach out and um, make sure that there's opportunities there. 
um, and just wanting to make sure that that those opportunities continue all throughout their their school career. <laughs> I agree with you, Mandy. Um, I feel like this is an important one just because um, as we start in early childhood, we always tell the parents that they're the first and foremost important teacher in a child's life. And so this is just such a great partnership um, for the school and the families. So. And we also brought in that community piece and just making sure that um, that the communities feel like they are just as much a part of our school as the school is a part of the community and making sure that we have opportunities for our students to become involved in our communities and vice versa. So we spent a lot of time talking about that as well and the importance of it. And we tried to tie these back to our belief statements. Um, as Ms. Gilman kind of shared in the beginning and maybe you can go back to the top there, but. Uh, for a split second, but in the belief sections, we shared about um, a little bit higher. There we go. Uh, uh, our school is the heart of a unified community. Um, we talked about that. And then also a place of mutual respect where uh, voices are heard, considered, and valued. And just because we can't always do everything that folks would always like, that doesn't mean we can't include them in processes to give them an opportunity to provide input and to help them feel considered and valued. And we can do that in a respectful way. And, and uh, so this was us kind of tying back to some of those different belief statements. Uh, members of the board, do you have questions around that uh, fifth goal, fourth focus area? I don't have questions, but I will just comment that I think this is a strong area for improvement and I'm happy to see that we can hopefully strengthen it and make it better here, so. Yep, I was just gonna say the same thing. Um, and I, th I think it's a great area to focus on as well. Uh, the sixth goal, or the fifth area, um, is positive school climate. And so in this one, GFW will inspire a shared sense of community built on trust, collaboration, and safety, where individuals are encouraged to thrive and grow. And so the way we'd be looking at measuring some of that is mm -hmm. through collaboration with our stakeholders, which is, you know, we, we saw in our strategic planning group, we had lots of different stakeholders involved in that. And that's that's what we mean by stakeholders. Um, GFW will develop a positive school climate model where all individuals can show up as their full selves. Um, that's, that comes right from some of our student language. And um, there are different ideas and concepts and models out there for positive school climate. So there's some work to be done and some research to be done on what is it that that means. Um, if you take a look at the school climate center, they would say, um, positive school climate is, you know, anybody who walks into your building, what are they feeling in that moment? And that, so it's an oversimplification, but if I'm a community member and I walk in, or if I'm a parent or a staff member or a student, what is it, how are you feeling and what is that experience? And that would be something that um, we'd be looking at researching and, and saying, okay, this is kind of how we're going to define that for ourselves. Um, and then we will create an implementation plan to do that. So again, it's kind of the implementation we we need to figure out what it is that we define as a positive school climate. And then we need to go through and we need to implement that and then uh, and monitor that we're doing a great job with that. And you know, success goes up and down with those. And that's part of the implementation science is that as it ebbs and flows, you make adjustments and, and retrain and, and re-implement some stuff. Uh, and then uh, the last one is GFW will develop a system of mental health information access and support for students. So helping increase access to mental health supports, uh, whether that be in the school, in the community, but get it, helping break down barriers to increase access and get information out there. So um, team thoughts that you wanted to share about uh, positive school climate?
One thing that we did spend some time talking about was the importance of making sure that we have those mental health supports in place for our students. Um, it, it seems to be hitting even harder these days. And, and as a school, we need to make sure that we have what our students need to be successful, including their mental health needs. Team, any other thoughts, members of the board, any questions about uh, the positive cool climate section or just the, the, the strategic plan in general? I um, was just gonna ask, is there any way that you could add in for the mental health information access and support for students? Um, I mean, even just staff in general, uh, I guess I'm not entirely sure what the resources are for staff um, as far as mental health, you know, support, things like that. Um, I don't know if that's, if that's an option or how that all works, but that would be my suggestion for maybe an addition or something to work on. Uh, one way to approach that would be to uh, eliminate the word students on there and just put a period after support. And then that would just be a little bit more all encompassing. We do do some things right now with that. Um, and um, Ms. Elmer, who is uh, one of our, our wellness leaders, um, is frequently trying to find ways to make people smile and cheer them up and, and shares out resources with that. So um, well, that's me walking in the office and seeing her in a great St. Patrick's Day outfit or sending out emails for, hey, this is, uh, here's some great ways to just to be positive and how to, to really focus on that and, and some strategies to go with that. So there are some things that we are doing and uh, we definitely want to take care of our staff members too. So I, I think that uh, that would fit very well into some of the passion areas that our staff have right now and would like to probably continue to work on. Her camera's off right now, but I know she's going to put on her outfit and she's going to pop back on the screen <laughs> with that outfit. <laughs> I do not want to frighten you. So no, <laughs> I will not be putting it on. <laughs> Little kids enjoy it. Not so much adults always. <laughs> <laughs> you look great. Uh, so how would you feel about us just putting a period after support to make it more broad? Um, and that could I even would, include family supports uh, too. Yeah, I, I think, think that, that sounds great. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to in, just, you know, not include staff or even family members for that matter. I mean, yeah, I just think it's, everything's in a stressful time and maybe things will calm down in the next couple of years, but I would, I mean, I know that there's resources out there for other people, but I think it would be great to not limit it to just students. So I think the period at the end sounds great. I don't know what anybody else thinks, but. I would my, agree. My So some feedback we've heard so far is a little bit more specification on the dates for some of the goal areas. And then uh, on that 6.3, just making that a little bit more all-inclusive. So taking out the for students and just ending it so it's more broad. Um, other feedback and thoughts that people would like to share? No, I think it's a good start. And I would just add in, uh, board members, is there anything that you remember we talked about that isn't reflected here? We tried really hard to incorporate all the ideas, but we 
you know, if there is anything that we haven't emphasized or that we've missed, let's talk about that. And it would, it definitely was not intentional. So if there's things that you want to make sure are included, we can certainly do that. I think we have hit most if not all the things. So. Well, while you're processing through that, I, I do want to give a shout out to our writing team who mm -hmm. was just absolutely amazing. And um, the conversations and the ideas that came up um, and the focus to detail, even on, on even on a specific word and going back and forth and going to do some research. And um, I mean, we set a time limit for the meeting and I think we all looked at the clock and we're like, oh my gosh, like we're, we're over time, but people just kind of wanted to keep going. And, and uh, Miss Gilman had to tell us, no, you don't have to, you, because we wanted to meet again <laughs> on it. She said, no, no, you're okay. Uh, this is good. Like, mm -hmm. you're, so, I mean, a great group of um, passionate people for education and um, some real wisdom there. So thank you to the writing team for, for all of your extra efforts to, to help get us to this point, to have a conversation tonight. Um, it was, you, you were awesome. I would certainly echo yeah. that too. And if I remember correctly, I think that uh, one of the days that the group met was probably a day that they weren't necessarily uh, on duty, so to speak. It was a, a vacation, a holiday, a time off day. And so hats off for the dedication and doing that as well. Yeah, it was, it was, they were, uh, they were finding ways to, to help make this happen. So mm -hmm. really appreciate that. We also had a lot of fun doing it too. So. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, there was plenty of laughter and plenty of coffee that went around. <laughs> anything else from the writing team or um, Mr. Horton, anything else you'd like to share in regards to the work that the group did? No, I agree that we had some good laughs during the process with this, uh, a lot, a little bit of fun with it, but also got some good work done. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun working with them and it's a lot of fun just going through the whole process to really listen to the community, to, um, offer opportunities for people to share their thoughts. And, um, but I also feel that sometimes when you see a strategic plan, um, you try to encompass everything and it becomes unattainable. I feel like this has really captured the, the major themes of uh, the community. And I think it's put it into some tangibles that we can say, okay, we can work on that. Um, and not everything will always work out smoothly. The life ebbs and flows. COVID-19 is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. We might have to say, oh, geez, we got to adjust a little bit. And that'll happen um, in different ways and forms. But we have some, I think this gives us some direction that is encompassing of of our community and some, and it's some good work and it's aligned to uh, areas that we need to be focusing on both from a, a local area saying that this is important, but also from a, a state and national level to say, these are some things you should be focusing on. So I think it's, I think it covers a lot, but it's also attainable. Well, it was a very thoughtful process with everyone involved and for board members and for community members who might be listening in, you've heard me say before that the strategic plan really is now your visionary roadmap for the next three to five years. You've identified those key themes to address issues, challenges, concerns. You have brought stakeholders together. So you've truly listened to the voice of the entire community. So there, you're really, you've got buy-in now. Uh, you will get to see this again at a meeting where you will do a final adoption of it. And the next time you see it, we'll do a little bit of cleanup with the uh, 
6.3 and then a few things with the timelines in here as well, just to make sure that they're very clear. And, and that was a very helpful suggestion too, Drew, to make sure you're talking about the beginning of 2024 or the end of 2024. I think the other thing to remember that it is a, a process, so three to five years, so uh, not an expectation that everything's going to get accomplished in the first one or two years, but uh, this is an example of how the work team, the work writing team, has really paced themselves too, and I think they've been strategic, if you will, in saying, here's some things that we should probably work on sooner versus later, and so all things will um, come to fruition over the years. As board members, once you've adopted this, it'll be important that you use this as a, a living document. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we look at the board self-evaluation. But when uh, your superintendent and board chair bring decisions to you at the board table, make sure that the actions that you're taking are accountable or a link back to the strategic plan so that you can, if it's not clear to you, ask, uh, now how does that fit into our strategic plan? And then the response will probably be, this ties back to student achievement under goal number one and objective number 1.3. So those are, are some of the ways that you can make sure you're being accountable with the work that you and everyone else have done. The other piece to this is, uh, you'll remember that uh, behind the scenes to accomplish the objectives for each of these goals will be a lot of action plans. So I know that your superintendent and your, your uh, writing team, your administrative team, have already talked about some action steps that they will use to accomplish each of these objectives. And what you'll be hearing back from your superintendent is an update on where you're at with things, how you're doing. Uh, and at the same time, Remember that, heaven forbid, if we have something like a pandemic that comes up in the next year, it is okay to just take a little bit of a step backwards and say, you know, are we still on track? Are we moving ahead with things? Or do we need to take a quick break, um, pivot a little bit, if you will, for anything unexpected that comes up? Um, but you should be having some regular updates on the strategic plan and at least annually take time to do a little bit of a deeper dive and uh, have some accountability of what we've achieved. I, I would also suggest too, once the board does the final adoption, to make sure that you share this document with all of the strategic planning committee members. And uh, along with that, a uh, sincere word of thanks for their work too, because a lot of them put in many hours along with the board members in helping develop this. So just some things to be thinking about moving forward with this with the strategic plan. So with that, any other questions that I can answer? Related to that? Okay. If not, let's transition into the next part, uh, talking about the board self-evaluation. Now, this is the time where the writing team members know that this is going to be really riveting and they want to stick around. Um, but I'm just going to say, if you do have other commitments, other things, you are certainly welcome to uh, depart at this point. We're, we're not going to, you know, not going to keep you here if you do have other things. But just a, a thank you if you are leaving. We just do want to say thank you so much for all of your work. And I think your superintendent will probably be meeting with you one more time to do some final tweaking. So you're not off the hook just yet. But anyway, but thank you again for your help this evening. The coffee ready. Get the coffee ready and <laughs> coffee and, and chocolate, I'm hoping, for everyone, right? <laughs> Why am I about that? Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. My kids are here, so I'm going to go. Okay, right. sounds good. Thank, Thanks, Mandy. Thank, thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, writing Thanks. team. Okay. For the board, then, we're going to transition to talking about the board self-evaluation. And this is a chance really just to tie this all together for you. The timing on this, when I start, first, first started talking to your superintendent about strategic planning back at, uh, what was the end of last year? Um, this is just such a wonderful opportunity for you as a board team. You have three new board members. You are in a reforming stage, so to speak, as a board team. And so this is a way for you to all really be on the same page and uh, 
helping develop the strategic plan is, is the beginning stages of that. So as we, we transition and talk about the board self-evaluation and how that all ties to the strategic plan, I wanna put up the board governance model and you had a chance to see this at each of the strategic planning committee meetings. And it is also included in our phase one training for new board members and in our phase three training for high performing boards. So at the top of the board governance model, the board governs, that is your role as elected board members. And at the top of this diagram, you'll see that your responsibilities at the, the very top, the 12 o'clock point is to establish. You establish expectations and parameters and you set a strategic plan. So hats off to you for having a strategic plan in place and an updated one too. And uh, in addition to that, you adopt policies, you set the budget and you approve contracts. And then you will see that the lower part of the diagram the superintendent manages. The superintendent provides leadership and supervision. And so Mr. Horton's responsibilities are then to take those goals and objectives of the strategic plan that you've developed and start putting them into action. So he's got plans. He will have procedures in place. He will identify staff who will work with him. And then he will start to implement them and he will monitor them as well. At the same time, you know that the arrows, or you can see that the arrows are going back and forth. He's always going to be giving you updates. Don't let him off the hook, by the way, either. So if you haven't had an update on something, it's fair game to always ask, where are we at with that on the strategic plan? Remember the um, friendly neighborly line, the dotted line that goes through the center means that there's always communication between you as a board uh, elected board members and your superintendent. And the most important thing in this diagram is student achievement for all. And I do believe that with the strategic plan you've developed, you have moved yourselves forward for that student achievement for all. Anybody have any questions or comments about the board governance model? If not, I am going to share with you, and I do believe that you received these documents from your superintendent as well. So you'll have them as an easy reference. So where are you headed now as a board? You have your strategic plan in place, and it's gonna be really important that you do an alignment of goals. We call this the strategic governance framework. And what you will see, and you also saw this during the strategic planning process as well, is that in this diagram with your strategic plan in the red box in the center, your, your new district goals that you're gonna be working on over the next three to five years, you wanna make sure now to align them, to align those goals with your superintendent's goals and also with your board team goals. Those goals then align with the buildings and the sites, the staff, the classroom, and the students. So now that you've got that strategic plan in place, there are no secrets. There are no surprises. Everybody knows what the expectations are. Everybody knows what the direction is. And just like with the board governance model, when you have your goals aligned at the top of this diagram, Again, the most important thing, student achievement for all. And when I think about that, I can't help but remember the wonderful students that you had on your strategic planning committee, uh, those that, and also those that participated in the listening session. You have some wonderful, caring, respectful, awesome students in your school district. And I do remember, I think it was Catherine one person that does come to my mind who was on the strategic planning committee who thanked you for providing that voice for students. And so this is what it's all about. And don't ever hesitate to hear that student voice. I know that you have a student representative on your board. And I think that is, again, a wonderful way for you to keep that communication going. So next, I'm going to move to another share screen as we keep this 
discussion going. And I want to talk about the standards for board leadership. Again, you see this in phase one and also phase three, the high performing board. So as board members, there are five standards that you operate under and they include standard number one, which is conduct and ethics. And this is about how, how you as a board team work together, communicate, respect, trust, and work towards those goals within the district, the new goals that you've just set. Standard number two is vision. That's that big picture, that big picture of where you are headed. And you've got the big picture now. There's no doubt about it with your new strategic plan. The third standard is structure. That includes your physical and organizational structure. So physical structures are going to be your buildings. Organizational structures are going to include staff and curriculum and technology. The fourth standard is accountability. Here, a lot of the accountability is related to student performance and um, student achievement. And then the fifth standard is advocacy and communication. And this is how you as board members and as a board team, remember I talked a lot about board team being uh, elected board members and your superintendent that you need to be joined at the hip in the work that you do. And so under advocacy and communication, this is how you advance or share your vision, your goals with the community and communicate that with them. And this is the, the one time where I say that it's so important for you as board members to be a cheerleader for your school district, because if you can't tell the good stories and advocate for the GFW school district, who's going to do it? And maybe it's time that somebody else be on the board that can effectively communicate that. So advocacy and communication is another standard. Now, underneath each of the standards, you'll notice that there are what we call benchmarks, A, B, C, D, E, and sometimes it's F and G. There's enough, uh, um, there's um, a, a variety of benchmarks for each of these standards. And I'm gonna do a tie-in to why that's important um, in just a second. I'm gonna stop sharing again. Those standards are actually the questions, those benchmarks, I should say, are actually the questions that were on that board self-evaluation that you took. And as we talk about having board team goals, it will be important for you as a board to do a self-evaluation on an annual basis. It sets a wonderful precedence. You evaluate your superintendent. Your superintendent ensures that an evaluation is conducted for all staff. And so why wouldn't you as a board also take some time to do an evaluation or an assessment? And all of you, I think we might have been missing one, but I think most of you um, took the self-evaluation. You'll remember that it was uh, 70, about 72 questions. You did it anonymously uh, because we, we aren't so concerned as to who said what as much as we are about how you felt in general about the, each of the questions. So each of the questions then did tie back to the benchmarks. And I am going to scroll us through a few pages here. Um, as I'm doing that, let me just pause for a second with the things that I have shared at this point. Board members, do you have any questions about anything? Anything that you want me to repeat or anything that was not clear to you at this point? Okay, if not, what you see on the, I believe it's the fifth page, I think it's the fifth page in, the, yeah, the fourth page in actually, this is an overview report. It's the aggregate data of all the responses that you provided. And so let me just set the tone for this, kind of frame it for you, if you will. What you see down the left-hand side, is each of the standards, standards one through five. 
across the top, you'll remember that when you answered the questions, your options were always, most of the time, some of the time, never or don't know. And so when I take a look at this aggregate data, I always like to look for the number or the percentage of responses always and most of the time. Um, the reason I, I combine those two is because there might be a question that I say always and Casey might say most of the time. So it, it's pretty subjective in that respect. But if you're responding always or most of the time, I think it shows that there is a lot of um, agreement amongst the board and a lot of overall uh, support for that particular category. The um, Next thing I take a look at is the numbers of some of the time, the percentage there of the yellow responses. Some of the time is an indicator that you as a board team will want to move some of the time up to always or most of the time. Then I take a look at the responses that are in red, the percentage, and those are the nevers. So never could mean that you just truly never do that or uh, discuss that as a board team, it could mean that since you have a lot of new board members that you just haven't been on the board long enough to see that particular activity or process happen. And then the final response, don't know in black. And so again, don't know means that you probably just don't know. It could be an indicator that you are a newer board member, and again, you haven't had that experience. So when I look at those responses that are red or black, the messaging there is those are opportunities for educating and informing. And usually between your board chair and your superintendent, they'll start taking some notes saying, oh yes, that's right. This might be something that we'll wanna talk about with the board, make sure they're clear and they understand uh, that particular topic. And so what you can see with your overall uh, responses, I, I always add up the most of the time and the always. And for standard number one, if I did my math correct here, 54% um, of you were in the always most of the time. For vision, 63% always most of the time. Structure, 46%. Accountability, 29%. And advocacy and communication, 50%. And as a, a general rule of thumb, you want to move towards at least 50% of always or most of the time. And really in most of your categories, considering again that you're a fairly new board uh, uh, and your superintendent took this survey as well. So all of you are fairly new. Uh, many of you are fairly new. Uh, your responses are either well above that or are moving in that direction. So that is a, a very positive thing. Any questions or comments about what you see in the overview report? Okay, if not, I'm gonna start walking you through the rest of the survey, but before I do, I want to make sure to be clear on a couple of things for you and for those who are listening in this evening. With this evaluation, it is not a pass or fail. It is not graded. And it is, there are no right or wrong answers. So you as board members responded as you saw the question and as you knew it at the time that you took it. And again, all of you took it just within the last, I think, couple of weeks. So it's very, it's very fresh in your minds. Uh, it, this tool is an opportunity to, first of all, first and foremost, pat yourself on the back because what you are going to see is that there are a lot of positives with your board team where you are cohesive, you are in agreement. And so this is an opportunity to celebrate those strengths. We also encourage that you take this assessment on an annual basis. And when you do that, you're gonna be able to start charting your progress because this tool is longitudinal. 
So now you've taken it in 2021. When you take it next year, hopefully, you will have both years results. So you can start doing some comparisons of how you have moved one way or the other on the, uh, with the responses. The um, other thing that I often am asked is why weren't there any open-ended questions? And we, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, it is a copyrighted tool that we purchased from Washington State School Directors Association, who are our counterparts, our MSBA counterparts. So we are not able to make any changes. We, we selected the tool because they use the same standards that we use, the five standards for board leadership. Uh, they didn't have open-ended questions. And so we did not um, make changes or could not make any changes. And then we use this as an opportunity for discussion. So if there are some questions or comments, we can talk about them this evening as we're walking through the each of the sections. So at the end of the day, the goal for you to take this board self-evaluation is to identify goals for yourself. It is to align your board team goals with the goals of your new strategic plan. And it's also a way for you to move to that high performing board status, which is so important because we know that when the board team is working together and all the cylinders are firing, firing at the same time that uh, it sends positive messages throughout the school, throughout the community. And you know that from your work as board members, your, your community, it, internal and external, uh, they are holding you accountable. They're watching you as they should. And so this is a, a way to help you become a, a really strong board team. Questions or comments about the tool? Okay. Then what I'm going to do is share with you the individual questions that were on the self-evaluation. I'm going to frame these for the first few so you kind of get a flavor of what you're seeing and then um, give you a chance if you want to make some comments or have some thoughts about what you're seeing and maybe some ideas of what are next steps. I've also highlighted some things too that want to make sure that we, we address on your behalf. So if you don't share them, I will certainly bring those up. So on the following pages then, what you will see is always the standard number, we're doing standard number one, conduct and ethics, which is how you as a board team interact. And benchmark of success A is highlighted with questions number three and four. And benchmark of success A is conducting board and district business in a fair, respectful and responsible manner. And the questions here, basing your decisions on what's best for student success and committed to a clear and shared purpose. And when I look at your responses, this tells me that uh, you are in agreement with some opportunities that the couple of folks said some of the time with some opportunities to move those forward with the questions or with the benchmarks, I should say. And then as we move to the next page, we're still under standard number one, conduct and ethics. And now we're talking about benchmark of success B, and that's ensuring that you as a board are accountable and open to the public, looking for divergent perspectives in your decision-making process. And uh, you have certainly done that through the strategic planning process by bringing in uh, community members, stakeholders who can help provide feedback. So here we see uh, question five talks about providing information to the public that supports board discussions and decisions. Question six talks about uh, following a defined process for gathering input prior to making critical decisions. And I would say here that as a board team, and I'm actually going to toss this one back to you in just a second, but uh, because We've got a don't know, and we've got a, some, some of the times here as board members, what else would be helpful for you in gathering input prior to making those critical decisions? 
Anybody want to share? When you're making the tough decisions, what else would be helpful? I think for me, a couple of things mm -hmm. came up pretty quickly as a new board member um, and just, you know, not always knowing what goes into those areas enough. So that's just myself, but I think as we go on, that should improve. Mm -hmm. So for newer board members, and a newer superintendent, sometimes you have to go slower to move faster. So keep that in mind. And I think as board members, don't hesitate to let your superintendent and your board chair know what additional information you might need. I think Drew brings up a good point too. Sometimes when it's just all so new, and I, I remember that as you know, from being a, a board member myself, when everything is so new, it's just a lot to digest. And so it it may mean during this time that even additional information is provided to you. Um, maybe some uh, additional uh, background information, but never hesitate to ask those questions. What about other board members? Anything else you can think of that would be helpful? Anyone? Otherwise, I'm gonna keep moving you along. Question seven talks about carrying out an annual assessment of your performance. And that is what you have done with the board self-evaluation. Now I should ask for the, uh, the returning or the seasoned board members. Um, let's see, Marissa, you might know the answer to this. Have you had a chance as a board to do a self-assessment before? No, this is the first time I've done it and this would be my year three on the board. Okay, sounds good. So certainly we know taking that time is important and I this would be one of those things that you might wanna make as a goal to do an annual assessment. And then you can see that a year from now doing that and taking some time to visit, whether it's having me come back and visit with you or whether you have the conversation uh, yourself, you'll notice that probably everybody's going to say, yeah, always, always, we do carry out an annual assessment. And then uh, likewise, question number eight talks about setting goals for improvement. And Marissa, again, I'm, I'm going to come back to you on this one. Have you as a, a board team in the past, have you set goals for yourself as a, a board team? I do not recall doing that. Okay. All right. So we will we will get you moving in that direction too. So it becomes just part of your, your routine practice and protocol as a board. Anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to make about this set of questions? I'm gonna keep scrolling on, but that doesn't mean we can't go back. Um, okay. I'll throw something out there. Uh, yes, definitely. Thanks, Mr. Horton. This is something that um, we'll be doing and we're starting the process with those continuous improvement teams. Mm -hmm. This is something we'll be doing with building teams as well, where they'll, we'll take a, a rubric like this or a framework. And we did this with our continuous improvement teams at the start of the year and said, okay, what does a good continuous improvement team look like when it's high functioning? Mm -hmm. And so they went through there and they ranked it and um, we're going to kind of continue to do that. So just so you know that at the school level, we're asking teams to kind of do some of that themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part of us making sure that we're, we're doing things well. Great. So you should, if, so if mm -hmm. there's ever a question later, you, you should be able to ask me and say, Hey, you know, how are those continuous improvement teams are doing? And I have a rubric that they've been working with to say, Hey, here's kind of how they're self rating themselves. And here's kind of what they're working on. And also when you have turnover, um, for example, when three new board members come on, it's going to shift your scores a little bit. And mm -hmm. so it might not always be continual growth. You might see, Oh, well, we dropped in this area and you kind of readjust and um, you know, you have someone like Gail come and, and share some of this information. Good feedback. And you know, that is a, a good point. I should mention too, when you think about 
a newly formed board, and I didn't talk about the stages of board development, but certainly from MSBA with some of our trainings, you, you hear us have that conversation. But with a new board, we talk about the stages of board development. And the first one is called forming, which is really what you have done over the last year or so. You formed with having a new superintendent and new board members. And this is um, that time where you know, you're, you're kind of trying to figure out what your role is as a board member and as a superintendent, maybe too, and, uh, and figuring out other board members and uh, how you interact. This has been a very interesting time too, because some of you only know uh, COVID board membership or boardsmanship um, because you've done a, you know, needed to do a lot of virtual meetings, but there's the forming stage there's the storming stage. The storming stage comes when, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you kind of like, I kind of get this now. And so you might not all be in agreement. You're trying to figure out again, uh, what information folks need and how everyone's going to react to uh, conversations that come up to the board, uh, decisions that come to the board. Norming is the third stage. And that's when things start to kind of fall into place. You, you know, what's expected of you. You know how to prepare for a board meeting. You know who to ask questions of. And then um, things start to get real comfortable in the work that you do. The, the next stage, the fourth stage is performing. And that's where we really want to get you to. And that's this whole process with strategic planning and with doing the self-assessment. We want you to be a high-performing board so that things really start clicking. The one caution when you are in that high performing stage is that sometimes you might move too quickly for your community. So that means that many times you'll want to bring your community along. You don't want your community to think you're a rubber stamp because you're not, obviously you do your homework and you work together and you're performing at a fast rate. But what it means is that uh, as a decision is being made at a board meeting, it will be important for your chair or whoever is presiding at the meeting to always provide some background information and explain that, um, you know, we're ready to make this decision this evening, but for the community, we want them to know that we have taken two meetings, two study sessions to review this. We've asked all the questions. Our superintendent has provided us with lots of background information. And now tonight we're ready to make a decision. You know, a good example of that would be your strategic plan. When you do the final adoption, it probably will be a very fast decision, a motion to approve and a second, and you will have adopted it. So what will be important for your board chair to explain that, uh, this is a process that has happened over a period of months and lots of involvement from stakeholders and lots of information. And so you can use that to model how you um, explain to the public and help the public understand the work that you have done when you get to that high performing stage. And then the last stage of board development we call deforming or reforming, which means that you have newly elected board members or a new superintendent. And that's exactly where you started uh, just in the past few months where you've had lots of reforming. So it was a time of saying goodbye to those that had served on the board and as superintendent, and then a, a time of saying hello and uh, reforming with a new board. So I think that's really important to keep that in mind as you are, are moving forward. Other questions or comments? I um, want to draw your attention to question number 11, using written protocols for interactions. And I am not sure if there are any written protocols for you as a board, but many boards do have some protocols that are written so that when newly elected board members join the team, they have an understanding of chain of command. They have an understanding of uh, interaction with a mentor. If you have mentors, uh, you have many times a protocol as boards for who contacts your legal counsel. You have hired legal counsel. So who can contact legal counsel? Can any board member call legal counsel or does it usually it needs to be your board chair and your superintendent, sometimes a business manager, 
But having those written protocols in place, it almost it also would be things such as when you're contacted by community members, how do you respond? Do you respond? What if a community member comes to you and they are having a real struggle with a, a teacher and they want you to fix it? Having those discussions and those written protocols of how you're going to handle that, because you as board members, your power is at the board table, so you can't fix it. But when you can do is listen, uh, have empathy for the concerns, and then help the whoever is uh, approaching you or whoever is asking the question, help them understand that there are processes in place that you have a chain of command and direct them to the chain of command or to your superintendent. So I'm not sure, do, um, board members who have been on for a while or Superintendent Horton, are there some written protocols that the board has developed already? I think we have some of those, but not okay. everything you discussed. Okay, sounds good. So that might be something that you'll want to take some notes on. If you need additional support from me or from MSBA on that, let me know. There are some school districts that have some, I'm, I'm learning over the years, have uh, some written protocols that I think are nice models that you could maybe use and, and then ad adapt them to your school district because just what you do, your protocols for GFW may not be the same for the next district or um, any other district. But certainly something to think about. And I think for newly elected board members, that would be really helpful. Okay, the next set of questions are still under conduct and ethics, benchmark of success D. This talks about policies. And keep in mind as board members that you are very fortunate in that the policies are there for you. MSBA creates model policies and we watch the legislature and um, both federal and national, and we create those policies for you as our model policies. And then whenever something new that you need to adopt comes your way, we have it there for you. It'll be brought to your board for your attention. And then you have the opportunity to adopt it as is or adopt it as revised uh, to meet the needs of the GFW school district. And Superintendent Horton, I think you have been reviewing policies quite a bit too, to get things up to date and, and make sure everybody understands them. And okay. The, I will just say for board members, what MSBA suggests is that you should be reviewing probably one third of your policies every year so that by the time you get through the first three years as a board member, you will have touched each policy and know that it's out there and reference it. And your policies are what you use to help you make decisions. And then the other policies that you'll touch during the year are those model policies that come your way based on legislation, or you uh, got to adopt some policies based on the pandemic this year too. Uh, question 14 talks about collaborating across the region, state, nation. Some ways that you can do that are just simply participating in your associations, MSBA, our leadership conference, our Friday chats from our government relations team. We have coffee and conversations on Fridays also. I, I believe all of you should be receiving those emails. So if you haven't participated in any of them, pop in and you have a chance to interact with other board members. They are also recorded. So those are available to you too. If you are not able to participate, you can at minimum listen to them and learn from that as well. But taking advantage whenever you can, uh, when we do our, our trainings, now we are doing a lot of virtual trainings, but for those of you that well, even in our uh, phase one and phase two, you know that we gave you opportunities to do some meet and greet with folks. So those are times that you can be collaborating and sharing with one another. Any questions about what you see up on the screen right now? Okay. 
The next set of questions talk about healthy relationships by communicating supportively, inspiring, motivating, and empowering others and exercising influence in a positive manner. And here you all seem very, for the most part, I think very cohesive. Now question 15 is interesting because it talks about providing an opportunity for stakeholders such as staff, students, parents, and community members to make presentations. Um, so it looks like you have those opportunities. Uh, looks like question 17, being respectful of one another. All positive attributes for you. And conduct and ethics working as an effective and collaborative team. And again, here it talks about having mutual trust, working with your superintendent to have that trust amongst all of you, pursuing some professional development opportunities. Again, you've got the conferences besides MSBA. I'm, you, I'm sure you're a member of MREA too, aren't you as well? So you've got that as, a, as an association with resources. Um, question 21 talks about orientating new board members. So for the three new board members, tell me what kind of orientation you had. Dan or Casey or Drew? Um, I guess I could say that we've had lots of conversations with um, um, other board members, superintendent. Um, we, I've done training through MSBA. Um, I know we are in the process of setting up um, meetings to do some additional training at the local level. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I have. Okay. Dan, do you want to add anything for as far as orientation? Oh, the MSBA was very helpful with understanding how everything works together. And um, other than that, it's just getting to know people slowly, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, COVID stuff. It's hard to, mm -hmm. in person, it would be a lot better. <laughs> right. Most definitely. Most definitely. Thanks. And uh, Drew, how about for you? I'm curious, did you set up mentors? Do you have mentors for new board members? That would be me. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're your mentor, Marissa. Yep. Okay. All right. And so tell me how you set up the mentors for your new board members. Um, well, I know Mr. Horton had asked the three board members if they were interested in doing it. And I think I'm the only one that responded that was mm -hmm. interested in doing mm -hmm. it. So okay. I've just kind of been a mentor for all of them as needed. Perfect. Perfect. Great. And thank you for doing that too. So we do have a um, new board member orientation year at a glance, which is on our website. And I will actually share that again. I'm going to do a summary for you of our discussion. So I will share that link as well. And uh, for the new board members, they know that that was in the phase one manual, but making sure to just check off the things there so that uh, you have been duly orientated. I know that there are additional things that your superintendent and board chair will likely share with you and continue to share with you. And then having a mentor is great. Just that uh, seasoned board member that can help answer questions, can check in with you if you have any concerns. And uh, the only thing we say with a mentor is that your mentor should not tell you what to say at board meetings or how to vote, because you know that once you took that oath of office, the job is yours. And now you get to stand on your own two feet and based on the information provided, make a decision at board meetings. So that takes us through the section under conduct and ethics. What questions, comments, anything you noticed that you want to talk about that I didn't address for you? Anything? Otherwise, I'm going to keep scrolling, but we can, again, we can always go back. So the second standard is vision. 
having those clear goals and plans. And now you've got those clear goals and plans in place with uh, your strategic plan. And here under this benchmark, it talks about um, expressing that all students can learn, having high expectations for students, and then fo fostering that culture of collaboration around a shared purpose of improving student achievement. And I think you've clearly addressed that in your new strategic plan as well. Also under vision, benchmark of success B, that vision for the district. And that's exactly what you have just now completed with your strategic plan. Um, and you included your stakeholders as well. And it will be so important to continue to keep your stakeholders, your strategic planning committee stakeholders and all other stakeholders in the loop and informed. So look for ways that you can involve them in things. Um, communicating rationale for decisions to the community. And again, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but making sure that as you're making the big decisions like your strategic plan, I'll use that for an example again, but explaining the process that you went through. And then for other decisions, if you're making a decision on the budget, uh, I think for each board member, it's always important to communicate your rationale for how you're feeling, how you're voting on something, but in general, um, helping the community know why you are making the decisions that you are making. Questions or comments about any of those? Okay. This set of questions is all about your district plan or your strategic plan. And so in another year, when you take this evaluation, I'm going to guess that your responses are pretty much all going to be always or most of the time. So you'll see that question 27 talks about uh, in collaboration with the staff and the community developing that strategic plan, the goals and the outcomes. So you, you have that accomplished, and then all of your ongoing work, your policies, your decision making, and the budget that you set should be tied to that strategic plan. And continually monitoring progress towards those goals and outcomes. And that's something that you will hold your superintendent accountable for. At the same time, he will always be reporting to you on status and update as well. Anything with how that ties in, and that, that will be something that I think for you as a board, you'll want to make as your number one goal, number one priority in the new year is to really learn to work with your strategic plan and make decisions based on it. Okay. Um, I'm still under vision, and we're talking about student achievement and student achievement that is aligned with your district's plan. And again, that's something that you just heard about earlier under student achievement. So you are set and you have that direction, um, direction set for you for the next three to five years, knowing that, that, that you will have high expectations for student, students and be looking at student achievement. Okay, that wrapped up the vision section. Uh, tell me what your thoughts are about vision. Any questions, concerns, anything you're wondering about? Okay, with structure. Remember, I, I oh, go ahead. Back to the vision mm -hmm. piece is that um, I just want to thank our school board for going through the process, both of the strategic planning process and um, the self-evaluation. I think one of the, something that we talk with staff about sometimes is it's very, sometimes living in the moment can be all consuming and really hard. I can feel like I can't get ahead and it takes work. It, you have to do the, the, you have to manage the here and now while you're trying to get ahead. And so we've had a lot of meetings lately and, and that's been intense, um, but thank you for doing the work to get ahead because now that you get that strategic plan in place, 
now you can start working ahead and you get a little bit more on that proactive side. And I always try to say, you know, we want to be, <clears throat> you know, we want to be mostly proactive, 75, 85% proactive. Um, we still need to be responsive, but a lot of things get planned. And so you've done that work um, as a board. And so thank you for going through that process with, uh, with Ms. Gilman, with myself, putting in the time as well as managing the here and now that we're trying to get past. So uh, this will pay, I think this will help support and pay dividends as we move forward and make things also easier. Um, not easy, but easier as you kind of work through things and kind of look back to, okay, what it was in our plan and, and why did, why are we going the direction we're going with some things? So um, I hope you find that helpful. And I think, and I just want to thank you for going through that because I know it was extra effort. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Yep, go ahead, Marissa. This structure piece. So yes. I noticed in the strategic plan, we didn't have anything about our current buildings. Mm -hmm. Should we? Because obviously we all know that our buildings <laughs> need work. Um, I was just curious about that. Is something? Is that something that should be in our strategic plan or no? It is in there um, mm -hmm. for a 2025 goal. Um, okay. Gail, I think you're looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, not to it. It was the facilities plan piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Nope, nope that's that's, okay. that's good. A, that's a good time to talk about it. Yep. Um, we didn't say whether that was staying put. We didn't say it was a new building. We left that open for the board to kind of process and decide, you know, is this, are we staying put? Are we going to build something new? Are we going to do some renovations or, you know, whatever it is that we felt that would be. And we put, we put 2025 as a goal. Um, it could happen sooner than that, but um, we pushed it out a little ways with the pandemic and just the um, time to get out of statutory operating debt. We we didn't want to put that as like a 2023 goal. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. I must have missed it. I apologize. No, that's okay. It's good to ask for clarification on that too. And uh, was that on the finance? Was it a finance goal? It's I under finance. Yeah. And I I do think as um, Mr. Horton said. You know, first and foremost, you have to address the SOD before you can really move on and talk about anything else. And so I think that's why it was probably it was a good decision then to look at that in 2025. So you can get your your financial status in order and then have those. And then at the same time, you can still be having those discussions about what you do as far as facility enhancements, if you're talking about building project, whatever it might be. But good. Thank you for bringing that up. Marissa. Okay, any other questions, comments? If not, I'll walk you through the questions under structure. So we're talking about safety and security for all. And as we look at structure again, that's your physical structures and your organizational structures. So in these two questions, and again, um, Superintendent Horton, I, I'm hoping you're taking notes on the nevers and the don't knows because unless somebody shares, um, my guess is that these are opportunities for helping board members learn and understand some of these categories. But really with these two questions, uh, your superintendent is the one that's going to ensure the facilities comply with the health, safety, security, and making sure that there's policies and practice uh, in place to evaluate. As board members, you are going to be hearing those reports and updates. So you can hold your superintendent accountable for providing you with those updates. Under the next section, uh, six, uh, Benchmarks of Success B talks about employing, supporting quality teachers, administrators, and other staff, and then providing for their professional development. And this is one that every time I, I meet with the board, uh, it's a good opportunity to discuss because as board members, you know, and you remember back I, from the board governance model that you hire and supervise one employee, and that is your superintendent. Your superintendent then in his management role is responsible for supervising, evaluating, and providing staff development for all the other staff at the GFW School District. So as board members, when you think about these three questions, a key word is ensuring. 
that these are happening. And if you're unclear, which again, many of you could be unclear, um, being new to the board of what the practices are. So at some point, it'd be a, a great study session or learning session conversation to just have your superintendent talk about um, how, what is your hiring practice? How do you retain staff? How, how do you evaluate? So you're not going to be hiring, evaluating, you're not going to be looking at personnel records or anything like that, but just knowing and ensuring that a process is in place. And likewise with staff development too. And the staff development was something that came out in the strategic plan, and that's actually been built into your strategic plan as well. So as board members ensuring that those things happen, anybody want to comment or ask questions about that section? Okay. Ms. Gilman, I, I would just yes. like to throw it to the board too, that as you're, you know, as you said, keep that, you know, take some notes and have this rubric in mind. As you look at this and um, think back to this as time goes on, please feel free to email me to say, hey, you know, I think this would be a great thing for us to learn about and know about. And that can turn into a, a board presentation. I can get a mm -hmm. team together and, and share some of the information. And so, um, you know, please don't hesitate to, to say, hey, look, can we get some info on this? Very good. The uh, next set of questions, talk about the learning essentials, the curriculum, the technology, the facilities. And you have had lots of discussions about learning essentials in this past year with distance learning. And so in this section, it's just making sure that you have students that are meeting those graduation requirements. A lot of these tie back to your new strategic plan, student achievement focus area under the world's best workforce and um, the, the two goals that you have, the world's best workforce and the um, continuous improvement framework. So this is how you will be accountable for each of these curriculum support, a budget that supports staff development and resources for curriculum. Uh, question 40 talks about having a process that includes community and, and parent involvement in selecting curriculum. Um, in this one, it could be selecting curriculum, it could be other types of parent involvement, but uh, tell me what, what ways do you involve parents right now within the school district for any of the board members? Do you have a world's best workforce committee might be one if you've got an advisory committee for that. Any examples? Parent committees? This is the one I can honestly say that I answered, I don't know. Um, okay. I mean, I do, I do know mm -hmm. that like, at the preschool level, there is um, like the parent advisory committee. So there are there are parent okay. involvement there, but mm -hmm. this is one that I can say I, I answered, I wasn't quite sure. So. Okay. And okay. I think I answered never on this one because mm -hmm. I don't know if parents are included in selecting curriculum and I think we can improve on this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. And I'm also thinking about your new strategic plan with the um, focus area of community and family engagement. So you've got something built in to help address that as well. But looking for ways that you can keep that involvement in, in an advisory capacity, because obviously you as board members have to take all the information that comes to you and use it to make a decision. Okay. Let's see, under structure, um, here we're talking about evaluating and updating your technology and then a long-term facilities plan in place um, for construction and maintenance. And so, you know, I, again, your superintendent is responsible for question 42 with evaluating and updating technology. Overseeing that, you have uh, an excellent support with Mr. Warner. I've come to learn too um, in this role to assist you. And question 43 goes back to Marissa's question before about uh, long-term facilities and what the plan is. And so making sure that you do have something in place for that. Okay. 
in this set of questions, it talks about the classrooms, effective instructional practices and evaluation of district operations to make sure that there's an efficient and effective learning environment. And from your new strategic plan that ties in beautifully underneath, um, again, student achievement in the, especially the, well, both the first and the second goal. So you have that built in for you. And I think this is the last set of questions for structure. Uh, this all relates to the budget and the financial statement. And you've definitely addressed your finances in your new strategic plan. Question 46 talks about keeping the community informed of your financial status. And I, I would say if there's one thing that you have had a lot of discussion about um, in a very public way, it has been your budget. So keeping the community informed. And question 47, it talks about public input into the budget, budget process. You have your public hearing on an annual basis, but if there are other ways that you can continue to educate the community on the budgeting process and just helping them understand uh, right now the education on the SOD, but also that there are, to put it in real layman's terms, pots of money that are designated for certain areas of school district funding and you can't use one pot of money to pay for the other and educating the community on what an appropriate fund balance is for you. So thinking about ways that you can share that information on an ongoing basis. And the rest of these tie into budget development that relates to your strategic plan so that you are setting your budget based on the goals of your strategic plan. Questions about any of those with finances? Okay. Then we move on to accountability. And a lot of this is accountability with student achievement and how you get to that point. And again, you'll see a strategic plan written all over this under accountability. Um, here we're talking about timely review of your strategic plan. So obviously you have done a very deep dive of your strategic plan this year. And what you wanna make sure to do in subsequent years is to not only have those ongoing updates, but also set aside some time a year from now, roughly a year from now, to just do an update. Did we say what we are, did we do what we said we were going to do? And are there some other new action steps to move each of the objectives forward in meeting those goals? So as you look at these, you can see again, how important it is to have that strategic plan tied into the school improvement plans. That's definitely mentioned in your new strategic plan. Making, uh, making sure you review. And then um, question 54 talks about recognizing the efforts of schools in improving student learning. So how can you tell those good stories when student learning has improved? Next under accountability, your superintendent. So we talked earlier about the strategic governance framework and having the goals from your strategic plan align with your goals as a board and with your superintendent's goals. And this talks about making sure that you have written goals with specific outcomes. It also says making sure that you provide an evaluation, a review for your superintendent on an annual basis, and then communicate those expectations. So you know that as a board, you can go into closed session to conduct the annual review for your superintendent. And then when you come out of that annual uh, assessment, you want to share a, an update with your community that here were the goals from the last year, your superintendent has met those goals. And for the new year, um, there are new goals that your superintendent will be working on. And then I always, uh, want to remind board members that as you are setting goals for your superintendent, you'll want to think about quality versus quantity. 
So identifying one or two goals to really focus on in the new year versus 15 will be much more attainable. And uh, keeping in mind that your superintendent is still managing all the other operations of the district. So for you in the new year, it feels like a number one goal is the financial status. That might be something that you'll want to hold your superintendent accountable for. And then um, a, a segment of your strategic plan. But with that, I'm, I'm going to ask Mr. Horton, is, um, has the board used the MSBA superintendent evaluation form? And any other comments you'd like to make about that too? Uh, we have not. Okay. Um, the the some of the things that we've done up to this point were um, in the 100 day plan, mm -hmm. we outlined some objectives and worked with the board to kind of develop some of that, um, in particular the board chair, and then we kind of shared them out to the community and then um, reported back on those, I think in October, so probably around 120 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had some next steps from there, but we have not gone through the um, the MSBA evaluation piece, either whether that be the goal setting, the competencies, or a blending of those. Okay. So that's a, that is an area that we could, uh, now that we've gone through the strategic process, mm -hmm. strategic planning process, it invites that conversation, I think, very naturally. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And I did, for the materials that were shared with the board for this evening, I did share a copy of the document for the uh, superintendent's uh, evaluation. It's a document that was cr created by the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, which is the association for superintendents and then also Minnesota School Boards Association. So it gives you a step-by-step -step of how to conduct the evaluation, how to set goals, and then even some criteria to measure um, 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 meets, exceeds, needs work on those kinds of things. So do make sure that you conduct that annual evaluation. Once in a while, I talk to boards where they're uh, nervous about doing that. And I think in fact, most superintendents are happy to have that evaluation because they are wanting to serve you in the best way possible. So do make sure that you take that time, set those goals. And you are always welcome to contact me or any of my colleagues at MSBA if you have any questions. And again, that tool is, part of your packet. It's also on our MSBA website too. So you can always access it there. Anybody yeah. have any questions or comments? Go ahead. I say, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, MA, if I recall correctly, usually MASA and MSBA co-present the mm -hmm. competencies and the goals um, at the leadership conference. So unfortunately mm -hmm. we had that virtually this year, we couldn't do it in person, but uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to do that back again in person and we can get the board to to, to go with it to that. Um, but I would agree with that and echo that, that most superintendents, including myself, welcome the evaluation process. We, we like to know what it is that you're looking for. So we can be working on that and strategic plans are helpful with that as well. Um, it gives us some direction. So uh, definitely welcome that process. Yes. I, I tell our staff all the time that Valuations are a great time to sit down and have a professional conversation about how things are going and how, mm -hmm. how um, I can be or our principals can be supportive of them and reaching their goals and celebrate the things that are going well and help support them in making the things that they want to get better at happen. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. We're next segment under accountability is measuring student academic progress and needs based on valid and reliable assessments. And so these are all talking about reviewing the data, having discussions at the board, uh, looking at how you can improve student performance, looking at any kind of data that's available. And you, again, definitely have included that in your strategic plan. And many times I tell boards that you should obsess about the results for your students. This last year has been a real challenge and I am guessing, I'm not sure where things are at in GFW, but in many districts, there's a, a sense that there will be some movement backwards before you can start moving forward again, just because of the pandemic and, and distance learning. But certainly be asking those questions because this is what it's all about is student achievement for all. 
questions or comments about any of those items or anything else in that accountability section? And if not, we'll move on to the last section. So this last one talks about advocacy and communication and how you tell your story. And a lot of the things in this category are going to tie back to, again, your strategic plan under the community and family engagement. And question 62, it talks about advocating at the state and local level. And at the responses, there was a lot of don't knows in this particular one, but do know that one of the ways you are already doing that is through the governmental relations process that we have at MSBA. So for new board members, you'll learn that there will be an opportunity for you to move forward through the advocacy tours, any legislative platforms. Um, we will do that on your behalf, and it really does start grassroots at your level. So if you have thoughts about anything that should be addressed in the legislature, it, you'll have an opportunity in um, late summer, early fall to bring those forward. And then we have a process in place where we start pulling together all of the ideas from all the school districts. And we have our governmental relations team who are at the Capitol lobbying on your behalf. And then they're monitoring all the other legislation as well. So if, again, if you haven't already done this, the uh, Friday chats are awesome. Fridays at 9 a.m., 9 to 9.30, and Denise Dietrich and Kim Lewis give you a quick update of where things are at in the legislature and keep you informed. And there's also a chance to ask questions as well. But that's one way that you have to advocate. And then certainly as board members, you always wanna make sure that you take time to keep your local decision makers informed as well, your local legislators. Um, question 63, I, I, I wanna just mention it because you are addressing it in your strategic plan, modeling the cultural, racial and ethnic understanding and sensitivity. And so with your focus area of diversity, equity and inclusion, you will be addressing that. Let's see, question 65. I always like to address this and especially with a newer group of board members. Earlier when we talked under conduct and ethics about written protocols, in addition, as board members, one of your protocols should be, how are you going to respond to questions and comments? Um, as board members, I'm sure you get emails, you get phone calls, you get text messages, you probably get stopped at the elevator, at school events, in the grocery store. And so do you have a process for how you respond to questions? And I'm just gonna open that back up to the board. What, what is your process right now? Do you have a process for responding? You know, I know for sure we have a process if they email the entire board mm -hmm. and our chair is supposed to respond mm -hmm. for that. As far as if we're out in the community, I don't know if I've ever got any official guidance on that. Okay. Okay. Other than maybe some MSBA training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other board members want to weigh in what your understanding is for question 65? Ms. Gilman, I'm not sure if you know this, but we have a grocery store owner on the board. So that ah. uh, example in the MSBA training uh, <laughs> video, as well as your example there, uh, we, we have one here. And it wasn't Mokels from Mankato, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So in that case, you might get a lot of comments at the grocery store, possibly. I think one of the I, things, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I do. And I mean, I have less than them. Um, I use the MSB training so far and then, you know, mm -hmm. I direct them to the appropriate person. So good. Thank you for that. And I, I think as a, a board at some point when you're talking about board protocols, you may want to just have a discussion about 
what your response is. Many times we talk about having an elevator speech, which when our constituents, our stakeholders come to us, it, I mean, it is so important that we're open, that we listen to them, that we're grateful. At the same time, we want to help our community know that as an individual board member, I, I can't solve or fix anything, but I can direct them to who can provide some assistance. And I appreciated um, Marissa's comment too. When you have, when you receive emails, and I, I'm sure you receive a lot of them, when they are sent to the board chair, it is always best, or when it is sent to the entire board, it's always best, I think, for your board chair to respond. And many times the response can just be, you know, very simple, short and sweet saying, thank you so much for contacting me or thank you so much for contacting board members. We are CCing our superintendent on this reply and he will follow up with you. So um, the messaging can be clear and that can vary from district to district. Sometimes the board chair takes the lead on that. Many times it's the superintendent, but just knowing as a board team, what your protocol is gonna be and how you're gonna respond, I think can just be very helpful. But bottom line is, you do need to listen and you do need to be gracious. I always tell the story. I was working with a board in a, another school district. And when we started talking about this, the individual said, nah, I don't deal with them. I don't answer their calls. I don't respond to emails. And when I see him, I say, don't tell me about this. Go talk to the superintendent. And I said, well, that's kind of good, but you, you might want to be a little bit more gracious in the whole process because many times people see us as a first point of contact. And the interesting thing is I did notice that that individual got defeated at the next election. I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, but it was just kind of an interesting coincidence. But so I would not recommend that approach. Uh, you know, find ways to be, be caring, be kind, and then help educate and help direct folks to the uh, proper channels. Ms. Gilman, this is, a, yes. I think, an opportunity to tie back a couple of things you mentioned earlier, too. Mm -hmm. is, um, I don't believe there's an MSBA model policy on this, but some districts have adopted what they call a, a chain of command policy or something yes. like that, which gives board members kind of some support and backing to say, as a board, this is kind of how we do this. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of point to that so it, it doesn't, it helps with new board members, but also gives you support to say that this is this was a board decision and it mm -hmm. depersonalizes it a little bit. So if right. that is ever something the board is interested in, we could look at that. And that would, you know, when we look at the governance model, that would be the board developing that policy on what you want that to look like. And then we would pass that assuming board approves it and, and then do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for mentioning so, that. I, I just made a note too, that yes, we do have a, a chain of command um, model, a diagram. And I will share that with you again, when you're discussing board protocol, board practices, that'd be a great one to talk through. Each school district has a chain of command that is a little different depending upon who is at the helm. So in some cases, it, let's say somebody comes to you and they do have a concern about a teacher, you know, the chain of command would be go back to the teacher and if you've, they've done that and it hasn't worked, then it would be go to the principal. In some school districts, it might be an assistant principal and then a principal. And sometimes it could move up the chain of command to a um, supervisor of staff, ultimately superintendent, and then finally the board. And so usually the questions and concerns shouldn't get to you as board members because it will have been addressed through that chain of command. But I will send that to you and that'll be a, a good discussion piece for all of you too. Thing, Great. Um, let's see. In uh, question 66, ensuring the public's well informed about boards roles and responsibilities kind of ties into having that elevator speech of what your role is. And this set of questions, it talks about making sure that decisions are communicated district wide. So how do you communicate and what's your messaging? And I think a lot of that for you and your new strategic plan will be addressed in your community and family engagement as well, how you keep those channels of communication open. And these are the last two questions. It talks about soliciting input. 
And this is very interesting. Um, question 70 says, seek community and staff input in its decision-making to gain community and staff support. So I think the messaging is to ask the questions, listen. If somebody comes to you with ideas, you can say, you know, I, I'm open to ideas and suggestions. At the end of the day though, question 71 indicates that as board members, you take all that information, you synthesize it, you process it at the board table with your fellow board members. And then that's when you consider, come together and make a decision. So just because a staff member or I as your community member say, this is what you ought to do, doesn't mean it's going to happen because you as board members know that there's a bigger picture out there on many decisions. So you take everything into account and based on the feedback, based on the things that uh, you know that tie into the budget or your strategic plan, you make a decision based on that. So that's the advocacy and communication section. Anybody have any questions or comments about anything in that category? Or any of the other sections that we've talked about this evening? Okay, I, I am going- just going over, I think mm -hmm. just going okay. over the process will help. Um, me prepare and kind of going forward, you know, how to improve and, you know, hopefully use our strategic planning thing for us to mm -hmm. continue to move forward. Now, I think it'll be interesting next year to see the difference. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thanks for that comment, Drew. I think it, it will really help all of you focus, work together. Comments from other board members, just in general on the strategic planning process and on the review of the self-evaluation tonight, takeaways for you. So Drew's is a good one. I think going over the process will help you as you make decisions. What are some other takeaways from tonight and from the process over the last few months? I just think it's been great to focus on, you know, what is our vision, you know, what is our mission and just sharing with the community where we're going from here and just including everyone along in the process. And I thought the self-evaluation was great just to see um, areas that we can work on as a board mm -hmm. and work together and kind of grow together. Good. Thanks for that, Marissa. Dan or Jason or Casey? Yeah, I'll, I kind of echo what um, Marissa said. I mean, and being new, and I'm sure Dan and um, Drew can, can concur as well. I mean, it's just, there's a lot right away. And um, it's just kind of information overload. And um, <laughs> we don't want to... We don't want to, you know, screw up too bad. So we, mm -hmm. you know, try to take in advisement from everybody and ask mm -hmm. questions. And, um, and no, I think this is great. I mean, going over and um, I mean, I answered a lot of, I don't know as to a lot of those things because there's a lot to learn yet. So right. um, little steps, I think, help us all mm -hmm. make bigger steps in the future. Right. Good. Thanks for that, Casey. And that's the, uh, the power of being a team, too, that while you are on information overload, you've got your teammates that can help share with that. And I think um, one of my colleagues always talks about um, so much information, it hurts my brain. And sometimes that might be how you feel, too. So much information that your brain starts to hurt too much. It takes up too much brain power. But anyway, it is a lot to learn early on. No, and I just hope, too, that the communities take time to watch this video, just because I think sometimes it's hard for them to mm -hmm. understand what truly our role is. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think, been difficult. I think sometimes they feel that we have more power in certain areas than we really do. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I struggle with as a board member. Yeah, that's good feedback. I, I think that probably happens with a lot of a lot of board members where the community because and you are you are different from 
a county commissioner or a city councilor or a township official or a legislator, you know, your power again is at, as you come together at the table with your superintendent and helping the community understand that is important. And sometimes we um, have been elected by certain constituency groups too. You know, we might have an organization, an association that has supported us. And then once we're on the board, they think that, oh, now Gail will do this because we elected her. And when you get on the board, you realize that, wow, that was great that you had the constituents that helped support you. There really is a much bigger picture. And you start to see that there are a lot of factors to take into account. So, um, you know, you have to, and then you have to start balancing that as a board member too. Because, you know, I had constituents that were supportive of me when I was elected to the board and, you know, had the, had, and I don't know if that's happened with any of you, but, you know, you have that where you have to explain that fine balance that, yeah, I know this is important. At the same time, we have all these things to take into account. I actually think that's why your, again, your strategic plan will be very helpful for you too, because you can always go back to that in what your direction is, what your focus is. And plus you, you have a team that you can work with, so. You know, uh, remember Lee, I, I think you bring up a really good point and I, I would even echo that as a superintendent that people don't understand what a superintendent does sometimes. <laughs> right. Um, and, and how my role fits with other leaders' roles or staff members or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps that could be a communication thing that we could do is we could start doing some, maybe that's something the board would be interested in doing is through our um, regular communications that we, we share some of that information out mm -hmm. um, and try to draw some attention to that to help bring some clarity and to help them, you know, I'm not suggesting that we need to have a chain of command policy that'd be for the board to consider. But if, if we had something like that or had written protocols or whatever, those could be things we could communicate out to say, Hey, you know, this is, this is how we do it. And sometimes I think that just helps people. So they understand the process they're, they're willing to follow it. If they just know what that is. Mm -hmm. Good feedback. And it, it is a fine line that you dance, because remember, I always say this, you're as a board team, you are, are hinged together and um, you're all getting perspectives. Your superintendent needs to do kind of the juggling, the balancing act too, because he's also an advocate for the staff and you know wanting to make sure that all the lines of communication are open. So he's communicating to you about staff needs and you know, you're communicating with him based now on the goals of your strategic plan. So it, um, it is a balancing act, but it's also one that, that I know you can, you can handle. Other comments? Dan, how about you, thoughts, takeaways from the process, both in the last weeks and also this evening, things that have been helpful or not helpful, struck a nerve with you? I'm getting sick of computer screens. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very honest, I think a lot of us are actually. That's right. I'm just not used to this. So yep. I'm an outside yep. person. But yep. uh, no, everything's been going pretty decent. Uh, MSBA was a lot of help, and uh, I don't know. It's, this survey has helped too, so you can kind mm -hmm. of see what's going on. So yeah, good. I'm glad because it again, it's just so much to learn when you're new. Now, Dan, I do have to say one of the benefits for me of you being on the screen is one of the evenings we got to see one of your cute little children, and that probably wouldn't have happened if we were in person. So that you know, I don't get to see the little ones so often. So that that made my night. So that was good. One of the pluses. Great. And let's see, Jason, are you still with us? Are you able to share a takeaway for you? I'm here. Okay. I, I don't know, listening to a lot of it. I've been through a lot of it already in mm -hmm. the past. Year. Um, you know, I, I can look back at what I did catch on the conversations. I mean, we've mm -hmm. done evaluations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yearly and uh, this year being different, you know, with the COVID and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff, we didn't, uh, get together like we normally do at the meeting up in the cities. And mm -hmm. that's usually where we've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's been a long road for, especially for new board members. It's been a tough, mm -hmm. uh, 
well, even for some of the old ones, it's been kind of a tough year last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But protocols and that kind of stuff. I mean, we've we've done, I thought, really well with that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, pretty much having the conversations with the people, um, taking it in and, you know, saying that, uh, you know, we'll talk to the, to the superintendent. We'll talk to the board mm -hmm. when I don't know. You, you get used to it as you go. Mm -hmm. are, are you saying it gets a little bit easier each year? Is that safe to say? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what? You get a little thicker skin. You do too. You still, I mean, you're, you're always going to have that emotional side of everything because they're, you know, you're, you're human and you're working with staff and you're working with the uh, most important resource in the district and that's your students. But yes, I think the more you experience all the different roles and responsibilities of being on the board, you start to have a better understanding and you put it into perspective. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, through time, you know, there's a lot of things that communities don't get to hear and, mm -hmm. and, you know, that kind of stuff that they may not understand, you know, listening to tonight will help if they do, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff that gets done in the inner part of it that they don't, they don't see, which mm -hmm. makes it, it makes it tough for us. Right. Because we do know a little bit more information, but that's why we're put there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So. You've been given that trust by the community and, and then they have to, just as you trust each other as a board team, the community has to trust too, that you are making decisions based on all the information that you have. Some of which you, you many times can't share either might tie into data privacy. Right. Very good. Any other comments, feedback, takeaway for this evening? Just as a new board member, I'll just say that, you know, um, with things coming up fast, um, Superintendent Horton has always been available and for us to contact and any questions that I've had um, with that, which has been great, as long as, as well mm -hmm. as fellow uh, experienced board members, you mm -hmm. know, if I've had a question to them, they've been able to do that and help with certain things. So that's appreciative and I just want to thank you and mm -hmm. hopefully we can learn from this and use our strategic plan to continue to, you know, be positive and build a good GFW school mm -hmm. district. Oh. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah, this is just your opportunity to, to really lean into one another. I, I just think you have a great board. You've got your seasoned board members and you've got your new board members with your new ideas, your new thoughts. And you just in a lot of, I, I think in many ways, a lot of fun time of transition. Some maybe it doesn't seem real fun to you some days, but I just think you have just lots of great things going on. You are all very, very capable individuals to be on the board. So your community should be very proud of who they have elected. And I know that you have all put a lot of energy into making the right decisions, the best decisions in the best interest of all your students. So with that, I am going to wrap up. Now, your superintendent said that we had to go till 930 tonight. But um, yeah, you know, we scheduled the three hours, two to three hours. He said, well, no, we got to go to 930. But I think we're just not going to listen to him. I think I think we've done enough now for one evening. But I do <laughs> early. We don't let board members out of board meetings early. <laughs> oh, I see. Julie says she's ready to go, too. <laughs> um, but um, I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing me to come into your district and for being able to assist you with your strategic plan. It was a great honor. It was fun getting to work with all of you, to meet all of you. And uh, this won't be the end or goodbye because I'm always available. So don't hesitate to connect with me. Give me a call, send me an email. Um, I'm available to answer your questions and support you. And if there are ever any times where I can come back and provide any additional information or serve as a resource uh, at a board meeting, don't hesitate to contact me. I wish you the best of luck with your strategic plan. I'm very proud of what you've developed. I think you and, and your strategic planning committee did a great job. I think you're well on your way. So with that, I will turn it back to, I think your vice chair, Mr. Haas. All right, thank you. Thank you for speaking. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. All right, do we uh, have any 
discussion that we want between the board right now or I'll make a I'll motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. No, we got I think we still got to go through uh do we want to accept that the strategic plan we have to make a motion for that first. I, I think that there was going to be a few edits made um, based on discussion tonight. So probably coming back April 19th, I believe, is what uh, was kind of okay. what All right. regular meeting. So I think unless the board wants to do something tonight, that would, uh, I think that's where we had taken it earlier. Okay. All right. I think we can, I think we can put on this. the 19th meeting. You know, table it for the next meeting. That's what I'm assuming. Yep. So, all right. Well, that's tabled for the next meeting. Then we'll take a motion to uh, adjourn then. Oh, I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. All right. Well, then that's all in favor. <laughs> well, how about Marissa? Well, there we go. Yes. Lee. All right. Merkel. Yes. Taz. Yes. Schmidt. Yes. Casey. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dale. Thank, Thank you, Julie. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Have a Thank good you. evening, everybody. <laughs> Take care, everybody.